Welcome back to another episode of the Coaster101.com podcast. I'm Andrew Stillwell, checking in from North Carolina. And joining me this week is Eric Woolley. Hey, Andrew. And we are joined right now uh, by Nick Weisenberger from our team. Um, he also writes for Coaster 101. He's based in Ohio. Nick, how you doing? Hey, this is Nick, checking in from Columbus, Ohio. First time on the podcast. Welcome, Nick. <laughs> Woo! First time. To- First time caller, first time <laughs> listener, first yep. time caller. First, well. <laughs> I don't know if Nick's listened to any of these yet. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Them. We're going to be joined a little later uh, by Shane, who was at Hershey Park today for the media day for Candemonium. But Nick was actually at the first rider auction for Orion last night. And so we're going to talk. Um, you know, for the first time in 2020, we're going to be able to talk new coasters, which is very, very exciting for a roller coaster theme podcast. So I guess, Nick, uh, my first question to you is, what was it like being in a theme park again? Oh, it was, it was exciting. I mean, after weeks of being stuck at home, not knowing when the next time you would be in a park going on a roller coaster. And you know, being stuck home with nothing to do, it was exciting to finally get out to a park. Uh, it was also exciting that the, you know the park wasn't crowded, even though you know, Orion was the only ride that was open. Uh, it was still n- nice to get out to the park for the first time, and what felt like forever. Um, obviously, Orion was the main attraction. Um, what are your initial thoughts about the ride? I know you wrote you wrote it a couple of times. Yeah, I was able to ride it uh, seven times in different rows, and it's a uh, it's a weird, unique ride. I mean, it's for B and M. I thought it was pretty different, pretty unique. Unique how? There's a couple moments where you get kind of like sideways airtime. I would call it or off access airtime. So like you uh-huh. know the, the traditional B and M hypers and gigas. It's about a lot of straight, uh, pretty forward airtime hills, where you're mm-hmm. just being pulled straight up into the lap bar. Uh, but there's three moments on Orion where the track banks as you're going over the airtime hill. So you, you, instead of being pulled up into the lap bar, you're being pushed sideways into the side of the seat. So you get like sideways airtime, which is, you know, like Intamin and RMC have been maybe doing that for a little while, but it's kind of relatively new for me and M I think. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like, is that, is that similar to like, uh, it, the way you describe it makes me think of the yeah. trouble cleft turn on. It's, yeah, Fury. exactly. Is that st- yep. similar to that? Yeah, yeah so it. I assume like that's probably the first time they really did that. B and M did, so now like they've taken that and now like oh now they've done it three times on Orion. So you rode seven times. Did you get seven different rows, or do you have do you have a favorite seat based on your seven rides? Um, I definitely found that uh, I, th- I thought the front of the train was better than the back because our, our first ride was in row seven, and I was like a little underwhelmed at first, but like. Each time that we rode it, I the, the ride grew on me more and more. Like I liked it more and more because we, and we also like each time we rode it, we seemed to get closer and closer to the front. So by like the last mm-hmm. ride, we were in row two, and that was amazing. So it, I think it's definitely a front of the train kind of ride. But you did not, you didn't get a front row ride. No, we didn't get front row or very back row. Were they letting you choose your rows, or was that is uh, that at least for now yes. being so assigned. They, they were letting people sit in every row, but it was only two people per row. So they would do like the two inside seats first and the next row would be two outside seats and two inside. And so like if you, if you had a single rider, they would, they could put two single riders in one row as long as you were both on the outside seats. And then if you had a group of people, it could then be the two people in the inside seats. Um, so gotcha. I, I think if you requested a row they might have let you pick but uh we never really requested one we just went to the assigned row Got it. um i mean it was i know that's a, that's kind of a covid protocol type thing they're doing you didn't happen to catch if they were going to do that on you know diamondback for example where the seats are kind of laid out that way anyway did you um no they didn't say anything about what was going to go on with diamondback yeah but yeah, that's a good point because the seats are already kind of staked like that. I guess I guess the park opened today to season pass holders. So yep. if anybody's listening, feel feel free to tweet us at Coaster101 or email us at podcast at coaster101.com if you know what they're doing. Um, let's talk about the uh, the theming inside the queue real quick. 
you know, the trend recently for Cedar Fair roller coasters has been kind of to tell a story with their roller coasters. And it, it started with uh, Mystic Timbers back in 2017, uh, happened at um, Twisted Timbers at King's Dominion, happened at Copperhead Strike at Carowinds. But, you know, what was it like kind of walking through that queue with all of the um, the futuristic, I guess, Area 72 theming? Yeah, that was one of the biggest surprises for me was how well themed the roller coaster is. Like, as you said, Copperhead Strike's probably like the best theming on a Cedar Fair coaster. It's been done in the past couple of years. Um, the best one at King Island Islands until now is probably Mystic Timbers. But yeah, I was really surprised by the, the theming of Orion. It has a, a space flight research theme. And yeah, as you walk through the queue, there's like testing equipment all over the place. There's meteors scattered around that actually like have fog effects and glow at nighttime. Um, they have a couple cars scattered around that have uh, like a bunch of recordings that you can stand there and listen to. Um, there's a soundtrack. And then there's actually a, a building you go through in the middle of the line right before you go up to the station that's a pre-show. Um, luckily, you don't have this. You don't aren't forced to stand and watch it every time. It's the line just passes through it, so you can, you can walk quickly through it. And actually, there's a there's a regular standby line that goes through there, and the what would be the fast lane line uh, goes through that building as well. But I don't think they're going to have fast lane at all this year. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, of stuff in that in that building. Like there's lockers on the one side that has like spacesuits and things like that in it. There's blueprints laid all over the place, and lots of uh, little Easter eggs. Uh, references to other coasters and rides in the Cedar Fair chain. Yeah, I was I was going to mention it. there we've got an article and it's a it's a spoiler alert for anybody who wants to experience the line for themselves. Um, but we, you know, you were sending me pictures last night and I was like, oh, that's a reference to Fury 325 or that's a reference to Volcano or Disaster Transport. There's just there's any number of little touches in there that, you know, the average park guest wouldn't see, but if you're somebody who goes to a lot of Cedar Fair parks, you definitely will notice, you know, the Hanover Hill Orchard or the um, the Firehawk Motor Oil. And there's, you know, there's a couple of tributes to Vortex in there as well. So, um, yeah, there's Nick, lots I'm of, assuming. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's lots of stuff, too, that's, I think, recycled from within the park itself that are kind of Easter eggs, too. Like some of the, there's like these big blue cylinder things, like some of them say like mm-hmm. 72 the Radium XL200, which is a reference to Begnum, but I guess that part itself was actually from the fountains, the old fountains that used to be in the center of Kings Island, right in front of the Eiffel Tower. So, really like, interesting. Yep. Hmm. So, like, yeah, lots of little details like that. Gotcha. You're somebody who has has ridden Firehawk before. Um, is it safe to say this is a a far better replacement? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I would say actually this, okay. is, this is better than Firehawk and Vortex combined. <laughs> wow. And you're just, you're going to throw hands with the coaster and enthusiast community. I love it. <laughs> There's a, I know obviously a lot of people miss Vortex, but to me, if we can get B&Ms in the place of every arrow looper that exists, I would not be too mad. Yep. Yeah. yeah I think like the, the, um, their overall quality of Kings Island's coaster li- lineup, I think uh, it's addition by subtraction, I guess. <laughs> I see. Um, is you know Kings Island now is one of the, the three parks in the Cedar Fair chain that have both a B and M Hyper and a B and M Giga, quote unquote Giga. We're not going to get into that argument today. Um, Thank God. But um, <laughs> you think that's? I mean, that's obviously by design. But how do you think they're going to balance each other out, Orion and Diamondback? Yeah, I know a lot of people were probably worried, like, you know, why are they building? this when they already have diamondback which is similar but you know after riding it a couple times i think the ride experience is different enough uh that they actually complement each other quite well because diamondback is uh, much more about you know airtime whereas orion's more just pure speed and forces and you get that sideways airtime which is different than diamondback so i think it's definitely a different enough rides that uh, they complement each other very well and you, I mean, one of those places to get that sideways airtime, I know from the renderings, I have not watched an official POV yet, but there's kind of like a, a wave turn like you would find on an RMC coaster. Um, is that one of the places you get that sideways airtime? 
Yeah, that was one of those the elements that I was most curious about going onto the ride because yeah, I was looking at that and I was wondering like how's that going to feel. And yeah, that's okay. as you're going over that hill, which I think is like 174 feet tall, you bank to the left so you're on your side and then you kind of get that airtime to the right so it's kind of pushing you into the side of the car as you go over it. So it's a pretty unique feeling. That sounds amazing. I really want to go to Kings Island now and I'm going to have to go very soon. Um, Nick, any last thoughts on Orion, uh, be it the ride experience, the theme, um, anything that you feel the coaster is lacking or could use differently or could do differently rather Um, just any last thoughts you've got. Um, I know like watching the POV video and that the the park uh, posted and just reading a lot of the comments on there, a lot of the complaints from people who've never even ridden it yet are that, you know, it's too short. It's like my first thought is when they're complaining about like the length of the tracks being too short, I disagree with that because Orion is 5,321 feet long. Um, so actually uh, I have a spreadsheet that keeps track of all the roller coasters I've ridden. So I don't know if like the 219 I've ridden, the average length of a roller coaster is 2,822 feet. And the majority of them are 3,800 feet or less. So Orion's in, in terms of track lengths, it's in the top 10% of the longest roller coasters I've ridden. So you, like, you can't say it's not that it's a short ride because it's a long ride. <laughs> what they really mean when they're complaining about is the lack of elements. So I think if you count the elements, like every time the coaster goes up and then comes back down as being one element, Orion basically has seven in which I think every other Giga Coaster has at least eight elements. Um, so that okay. is like the one probably b- big complaint that people are going to have is like, oh, I just wish there was, you know, one more element that would really take in the ride to the next level. And what would you tell those people who complain? <laughs> <laughs> just be happy that we're, they opened a 300-foot roller coaster this year. I mean, I think part of that, Nick, is getting into how, uh, like, how does this compare in your mind to the other gigas that you've ridden? Yeah, I guess that's the other thing I wanted to mention is by far my the, the best part of the ride, my favorite part is the first drop. The first drop on this thing is so good. It's amazing. Like, it feels like it just goes on forever. And I, I really think if you took somebody who, who didn't know and you put them on Millennium Force and then you put them on Leviathan and then you put them on Orion and then you ask them, which one has the biggest drop? I think they would say Orion. I I think B and M used all the other Giga coasters as practice, and they finally like perfected the first drop on this ride, where they just figured out, you know, the exact perfect uh, curvature, uh, just to get that perfect feeling of of that free fall that just feels like it keeps going on and on. So I think that yeah, the first drop was really awesome. And you wrote it. You wrote it during, you know, what I would consider daytime, but you also got a couple of night rides. Uh, which is better? Um, it definitely seemed to get better as the night went on. So I don't know if it was just heating up or because the temperature was cooling off or or what it was. It just made it feel faster and more forceful. Yeah, the, as the day went on, like the, it just kept getting better and better. So, yeah, the, the last ride at night when it was getting dark was the best one. All right, Nick. Well, we really appreciate it. Can't, can't wait to get up to Kings Island and ride that. Cool. All right, Thanks, Nick, Nick. We'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. So now we're going to change gears a little bit and bring in Shane Joseph, who's been with us on a bunch of our episodes, as well as special guests that we weren't sure was going to be here. Uh, Kyle Lindner, another Coaster 101 writer, also based in Ohio. But uh, both of them were at Hershey Park for the media preview and season pass holder preview of Candemonium. Um, so now hearing about Orion, figure we'll also hear about Candemonium, the other new for 2020 coaster that actually <laughs> just opened. Um, but maybe actually start, guys. Uh, we So it's not just that Hershey built a new coaster. They've also sort of redone the whole entrance and the area around Candemonium. Uh, what can you tell us about the new the sort of new entry plaza. Kyle, let's go to you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, not only did they just build a new roller coaster, they kind of revitalized the whole front of the park, which used yeah. to be kind of, I mean, definitely dated. And they took something that 
was dated and turn it into something very modern, but it still fits in with all of the new area. The brickwork matches the the chocolate world next door. Yeah. And it just it's like a seamless transition and it's really cool that they're they're kind of turning the whole front of the park into kind of a downtown Disney esque feel. So there's gonna be stores, there's looks like there's gonna be room for expansion for more stores too. So um yeah. Are there are there restaurants out there as well? I, like I remember going to Hershey Park two years ago, and like I think for dinner or something. Like I left the park because there were actual sit down restaurants outside the park. Is that yeah. part of it as well? No, it looks like the the new store they have. It's a huge storefront out front, and there's maybe one or two restaurants going in there. From what we could tell, there's a seems like a fine dining restaurant downstairs, possibly behind some some fancy glass doors, and then there was also like a balcony section. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see what they, they do with that. I think there's some uh, in the initial announcement that they made last year, uh, there's some renderings of that and they kind of go into more detail about what that's going to look like. Um, and they, I believe, uh, already announced that they pushed that back to uh, next summer. Uh, so it won't Got be it. Uh, all of those restaurant uh, won't be open this year, but hopefully uh, they're planning to get it done by next summer. All right, cool. So then uh, I guess that means, so Candemonium's like right inside the park there when you, after you go through the actual gates, right? Yeah, you can even see it from like when you're driving up and it's totally like definitely going for like a, you know, gatekeeper or fury uh, type entrance where they have the whole new modern redesign with the coaster going above it. Um, So I guess talk maybe a little bit about Actually, like the ride, the area in front of the ride, I guess, has also been redone. So you sort of like they've got the redone entryway of the park and then you go in and the entry to the ride, I assume, is sort of right there in the front as well. Yeah, actually, when you you first walk into the gate, you're you're greeted with the new Hershey Kiss Fountain that wasn't done when we were there. But you can tell it's going to be a stunning uh, picture as soon as you walk into the park. But and the the last the final turn of the roller coaster goes around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, when you when you first come in at the gate, you actually turn to your left and go down uh, more of Chocolate Town. And there's stores okay. along your left, which uh, there's a couple retail places and a VR experience. But you actually go down this path uh, a couple hundred yards and then veer to a right. And then the ride entrance is back there. Is the is entry queue area of the ride themed at all? Or is that? Yeah, the they have an enormous sign, which is awesome. And we didn't get to see it at night, but I'm sure it is going to be really cool at night. But the the theming basically is candy. It's Hershey, and which is really cool. And the whole station is has these bright graphics that are kind of zoomed in on each candy's logo, and they put it on these like the square format, and it's just amazing to look at. Like the, the designer in me had a ball just looking at it. So uh, I was very impressed with the the design behind it for sure. Uh, and it's definitely, too, something we noticed between uh, Candemonium and the uh, new dark ride they got last year, the oh, updated yeah. dark ride, yes. is uh, they're going, they're leaning major into the candy theming. Because before this, um, you know, their rides were themed sort of in name pretty much alone, um, but it wasn't wasn't anything to do with the actual Hershey brand. But now they're definitely moving between Chocolate Town, Candemonium, and uh, the Reese's Cup Fusion, which was yeah. their dark ride they got last year, um, they're really uh, zoning in on the brand, which I think is a good thing. It's going to help them uh, stand out. And it's a lot of these, um, like the way that the Chocolate Town is designed, uh, it's very obvious they're going for these uh, Instagrammable spots, uh, like the fountain or the entrance with the big sign and the lights. So having that brand there is definitely going to help them become uh, more well known, I think, and recognizable to anyone who would see uh, any pictures like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we also should talk about the the landscaping. Yeah. This this coaster sits like in this little valley as you enter the park, and there's a big creek that runs through that area, and just a very impressive amount of land that it sits on. Which uh, when we were there, it wasn't 
uh, landscaped at all. So, but the crews were hard at work. You could tell, like, just from the beginning of the day until we left, we could tell rock work was done, and uh, there was crews there all day working on it. Is that so? So I've only been to Hershey Park the once. Is there was there something there before, or was it basically like an empty spot? I think it was just kind of an empty area near their entrance um, where the old entrance was. Maybe there were some like buildings back there or something, but nothing like they totally cleared that out. Yeah. From what I remember, it was like a kind of a wooded entrance and it was kind of a long walk down the lane until you got to the the comet area. But now it's like completely open. And once they get the landscaping in there, it's going to be amazing. it's just like a little wooded area. So very nice. cool. Cool. Um, I guess now we can sort of get into the ride. Um, how many times did you, were they letting, was it only open for media or was it also open for uh, pass holders? Uh, in the morning, it was only open to media. So they blocked out an hour uh, in the Got morning it. for media to do it. And then the rest of, so the park was only open for pass holders that day, like we said. Um, so after that, uh, hour, it was open for everybody. Okay, cool. Um, so how many times were you guys able to actually get on it? Uh, and were you, and were you able to try it in different spots? I guess uh, yeah, actually we, we were, we got, uh, three rides in the morning, uh, with the media. And then we came back later in the day because, uh, these past few days I've noticed just from looking at the app and hearing what people say after about two o'clock, you're not going to get more than a 15 minute wait on it. Um, Oh, really? So, yeah, it was really great. We got to go back uh, and ride it again. So we definitely we tried out the different seats. Our first ride was in the back uh, area, you know, not totally the back row. But I think we were like row six or something. Uh, then we tried towards the front, then kind of in the middle, I think. And then our last one, uh, we got in the very back, which was my personal favorite. Yeah, definitely. Got it. Nice. I guess, um, Kyle, can you sort of like walk us through the uh, like the layout and sort of how the coast are oh, yeah. and like so uh after the first drop you go right into a uh, big airtime hill and that's probably my uh favorite part of the ride uh it seemed like from the bottom of that airtime hill to the other side of the bottom was you were just completely out of your seat um i'm a big fan of diamondback at king's island and yep. the airtime on that ride but it felt like this this one hill was uh over the top for sure. And so you go right from there into the turnaround transition, uh, very quick, very, it's much smaller than the turnaround on diamondback. I'd say it's like almost half the size. It really whips you around there and sends you back into a couple more, uh, airtime Hills. And then a really cool, like kind of half banked turn through the lift Hill and shoots you back down actually right towards the front gate. And that's when you get right above the Hershey Kiss Fountain and some amazing video opportunities there for sure, which is uh, especially when that fountain gets finalized. Yeah, I mean, I certainly remember in the renderings that sort of looked like the, the, the signature yeah, shot. It's definitely the signature games. shot. But uh, actually from there, it you hit another airtime hill before going into one of two brake runs. So it's... It was just, we noticed it as soon as we walked in. We're like, "Hey, it looks like there's two brake runs there." And the first one kind of gets you stopped at like a just a medium speed. You're still kind of going through, and there's a transition between the two brake runs that kind of drops you down into like a little bit of a helix and then back up. And it's surprisingly, or I was definitely from the back, you got a little airtime actually going into that. So it was kind of like a, just like a cherry on top for the ride. Earlier when Nick was talking about Orion, he talked about how it felt uh, it felt different than a lot of the other sort of BM, B&M hypers and gigas. And one of the big things was he felt like there was a lot more sort of uh, banking like on airtime hills. So you got kind of like, he described it as sideways airtime where you're mm-hmm. sort of like lifted to your side. Was there anything on this that sort of stood out as, differentiating it from something like Diamondback or Nitro or one of the other B&M hypers that are great, but sort of sometimes feel, feel similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so this was actually my first uh, B&M hyper or Giga, which was very oh. interesting because we talked about that. I've been to a bunch of different parks. <laughs> Somehow 
all of the ones I've been to never, never gone on one of these, but um, something, even from the animations, we noticed this, uh, like you were saying with the uh, sideways airtime, they have that um, kind of like half wave turn thing that Kyle was talking yeah. about under the yeah. lift hill. Uh, and then there's another one uh, when you're going into, I believe it's the first break run. And before you get there, there's another little sideways element. Very much, I feel like, uh, inspired by an RMC type, that mm-hmm. sideways out of your seat. Or um, even, I mean, we're seeing more of this, the first, um, after the launch on West Coast Racers, the very first high five element um, where you're, again, sideways like that. So they're very unique. I feel like there's nothing quite like that on any of the other models like this. I don't know if you've, uh, either of you guys have been on uh, more of these or Kyle, since you've been on uh, a few different ones, maybe how they compare. Yeah, Kyle. yeah um, like I said, Diamondback, we were, uh, all got on Raging Bull last year up yeah. at Great America. And I think as much as you can say, like all these hypers are very similar, they're, they're very different too. And yeah. as much as like Can- Canemonium felt like diamond or diamondback right after our first couple of runs, the, the second two rides we took on it kind of differentiated it a little bit for me. And the, definitely that turn element that you were talking about that along with the, uh, the giant turn around the fountain and a couple of pops of air time at the end, definitely changed it. Or uh, you can tell it's a B and M, deliberately tries to make these all different yeah that's very it's interesting hearing all of that because it sounds sort of uh, similar to some of the things that nick said about orion and sort of makes me think oh they're, they're trying some new tricks with these new coasters so right they're, they're not not willing to take a they're willing to take a risk definitely yeah, try, uh, sort of it, it's uh developing instead of just sort of cookie cuttering the same thing right. um you mentioned uh the back row was the best was there did you feel like a significant difference between the different positions? It's definitely not not significant. We said that from the beginning when we got after our second ride because we were in the back and then the front. Um, there's really not a bad seat on Candemonium, um, which I think is the case with a lot of uh, the B&Ms, but this one uh, in particular, um, just because the, the layout is so, the airtime is effective in any seat. Um, the reason I think that I preferred the back uh, is that just for personal preference, I like uh, a little more intensity and a little more speed. So getting uh, whipped over the first drop is awesome, um, as well as some of the uh, hills, especially when uh, there's a couple trims on here. Uh, on I think there's two, uh, one towards about the middle and then one on uh, one of the last airtime hills. Um, I actually almost preferred when the trims were on because you have that little moment of stall and then you get whipped over the it's almost like a whole other drop especially from the back uh getting whipped over the top of those airtime hills so uh, you get pretty much the same sensation uh in the front and the back but in the back you're gonna get a little more whip were they um i guess so uh, obviously it's a weird time for ryan roller coasters right now and things are always a little different were they loading how were they handling like social distancing on the coaster or disinfecting or any of that were they loading every row or every other they were loading every row uh, as long as you were with your group. Okay. So they weren't letting people from another party sit with you. But if you had four in your party, you definitely could all four sit together. Um, it was weird, though. We did notice on a few. It was the that policy, the skipping the row policy was pretty inconsistent. Um, yeah, I would yeah. say about half the rides were doing it and half the rides weren't. Um, and then later on the day, some of the ones that were had stopped doing it. So I don't know what the reasoning behind that was. I feel like if they're going to, they should either have the policy or not, um, because it, it just, by having it be inconsistent, it kind of makes it irrelevant. So yeah. uh, I wish they were a little more, at least if they weren't going to do it, at least not do it on all of them and have a, a clear policy. But other than that, um, I would say the, the policy enforcement overall was really good. Um, everybody had a mask on and the f- couple times that we saw somebody without one, the employees were, were right on it. They would call them out right over the, uh, the loudspeaker, tell them to put it on. Um, and then in the actual lines themselves, um, some of the rides where the queues are a little more close, they were skipping um, 
rows in the queue themselves. Oh, God. Um, yeah, and then they had the uh, social distancing markers on the ground. Um, they weren't always, I mean, you could, you can distance as best you could in the lines, but, uh, you're kind of at mercy at whoever's behind you, um, because there were definitely, (laughs) definitely not always six feet in the line. So you just kind of had to stay conscious of that yourself and kind of do the best that you can and not rely on anybody else. Yeah. Like in the switchbacks for sure. Cause they have, you know, front to back, you can distance yourself, but the switchbacks, you're a foot two yeah, away yeah, from yeah. someone at some next point somebody next to you. so it's it's a little tricky so i guess maybe sort of uh wrapping up i know uh shane i know that like uh hershey has some of your favorite coasters sky rush i think is, is maybe your favorite coaster yes um, yep and you guys both having now you spent the day in hershey park which will uh i think in the next episode we'll get into more of sort of hershey's uh overall reopening but uh how does it feel like Candemonium? How does it fit into Hershey's coaster lineup? Because I think there was probably some, when it was announced, some sort of question of like, well, they already have giant fast roller coaster in Sky Rush. <laughs> like, how does it, how does this feel like in fitting with that? Is there what's what's the niche that it gets in the parks coaster lineup? Well, uh, I think, and uh, I was talking to because again, when it was announced, it was kind of like, well, they already have hyper with sky rush so it's but i mean it's a completely different ride experience the uh airtime on candemonium and the airtime on sky rush could not be more different uh candemonium is that you know glossy smooth kind of glorious floater airtime and then sky rush is literally like you are being yanked out of your seat in every single element it's extreme yeah. ejector airtime um, and candemonium is kind of the lighter um consistent floater airtime rather than the jabs of uh ejector you get on sky rush um but i don't know kyle do you think that it, it fit well overall in the lineup i think it was absolutely perfect for what they have right now um if you look at their lineup they have a little bit of everything classic woody yeah. sky rush the the launch coaster the wild mouse the indoor wild mouse racing woodies uh More you know fahrenheit woodies, yeah. yeah fahrenheit with the over 90 degree drop and i think this is what they were missing for sure is like that kind of transition between the, the family ride and the ultimate thrill ride. This, this ride is like, like Shane said, it's glossy smooth and definitely re-rideable. And that like with sky rush, it's very intense and you might not want to ride it over and over again, but you could stay on candy Monium all day. Cool. Uh, any uh, any like putting you on the spot where this now ranks in the <laughs> among the Hershey coasters? I hate uh, ranking coasters, so I'm, <laughs> we don't actually have to do that. But. No, that's okay. That's okay. I like it, so I'll <laughs> I'll definitely I'll bite. Um, so for me personally, like I said, I'm I'm all about speed and intensity. So my number one is Sky Rush. Uh, number two at the park would be Storm Runner. Uh, then Candemonium comes in at number three for me personally, um, and then probably I would say. Uh, Fahrenheit, um, and then either Great Bear or Lightning Racer. I haven't really thought that far ahead. Uh, but I don't know, Kyle, do you feel the same way? I mean, yeah. I mean, the last time I was at Hershey Park was my 10th birthday. And so, oh, so-, <laughs> so there's been, there's like eight new roller coasters there since then. And I was really pumped to get there and ride them all. But unfortunately, Storm Runner was down. Yeah, it's down for the uh, season. Wildcat was down, which was it was also down when I was 10. So, <laughs> but, uh, from what I've been on now, uh, I agree. Sky rush is the best one there for, uh, thrill seekers. And, but, uh, I'm also a big fan of the B and M inverts. So great bear is up there, but I think Candemonium is definitely like third or fourth on the list. It's, it's right up there. And just with a little bit more intensity, it might jump up another spot, but definitely not complaining about it at all no and, yeah, and i think awesome. it's it's worth mentioning too that um this is both me and kyle i feel like have a very similar taste in coasters um with yeah. the kind of extreme intensity but if you if you're a b&m person and you love that floater if you love those big turnarounds and the airtime hills, yeah. you will absolutely love this ride and if it's um rewritability um is key because 
you know, most people aren't going to want to do Sky Rush a bunch of times in a row or even a bunch of times in the day. Um, but Candemonium is the total opposite. You can you can go on that thing all day and, and never get tired of it. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, any last thoughts on it? Anything else you want to add? Um, I think that pretty much I, I would guess uh, I would say thank you to Hershey Park. Uh, their PR team is awesome. As always, they were super nice, super friendly, answered our questions, uh, helped us out, very accommodating uh, for media day. So definitely a special shout out to uh, Hershey Park PR team for being awesome hosts, having us at this event. We had a great time. Cool. Kyle, any last, any last uh, one line thought on, on Candemonium? I will say we did not touch on the color scheme. Oh yeah. It seems like a lot of rides you get these very bright, bold colors, but Hershey went with the, the milk chocolate and silver, just like their classic Hershey bar wrapper. And it, it just seems natural in that area. And, but they brought in the pops of color with the trains, uh, the red Twizzlers train, the orange and yellow Reese's train and the blue kisses train. So it's just really cool to see that contrast on the ride. And I thought it was really well done. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that was something that stood out to me as well. Like just from looking at the pictures of it is like, yeah. who would have thought that a Brown coaster would actually look that good. <laughs> right. One really sleek. Looks different from all the like orange, green, red coasters that are usually out there. And it's also like, oh, that's actually really solid for. Yeah. Yeah. It fits into the area really well, for sure. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much, guys, for stopping by and, and telling us about uh, Candemonium. And then I think uh, next episode, we'll have you also talk sort of about Hershey more in general and the park reopening. Um, but uh, sounds very exciting. So now we can uh, happily say that both Orion and Candemonium sound like <laughs> excellent coasters. Um, so thank you, Shane. Thank you, Kyle. Also, thanks to Nick for talking about Orion. Um, as always, thanks to JM Music Design for providing our theme song. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to them. And if you can leave us a rain and review, that would be great as well. And as always, you can find us on every social media platform at Coaster11. Uh, Kyle and Shane, you guys wrote uh, your review in written form is already up. I think got posted right away. Uh, yep. So go check out uh, the full review of Candemonium. Um, and if you've got any podcast feedback, uh, you should email us at podcast at Coaster101. And we will be back next time to talk about some park reopening stuff.